And I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to put this in slideshow mode. And we'll officially get started. Um, first of all, happy Pollinator Week. Um, it was just serendipitous that this webinar happened to co coincide with National Pollinator Week, which is all week. Um, so we're glad to have everybody here to, to learn all about that. Um, this is part of our regular webinar series at 1000 Friends of Wisconsin. We host them roughly once a month and on various topics. And this is a little different than some of the stuff we've been talking about lately. So we are really excited to have everybody here. Um, I have disabled the chat for now, but there will be time for questions at the very end. So save those up in your head and put them in the chat at the end of the presentation. Uh, 1000 Friends of Wisconsin, if you're not familiar with our organization, was founded in 1996. Uh, we got comprehensive planning and smart growth law passed in the state. Uh, we're an environmental organization dedicated to land use planning and transportation policy. And our whole goal is promoting healthy communities across the state. One of the ways we do that is through our Active Wisconsin program, which is a coalition of statewide of communities and advocacy groups who want to make it possible for everyone to walk and bike and take transit to get where they need to go. You can see all of our social media handles there at the bottom of the screen, but the best way to keep up with what we are doing is to sign up for our e-news, which you can do from either the 1K Friends website or from Active Wisconsin. That goes out about once a month, so we don't spam you. I wanted to kick off the, the whole webinar today by just um, giving a little introduction to community science and how all this came about before I hand it off to our guest speakers. Um, Community science happens when communities and scientists do science together to advance community priorities. Um, so rather than read the rest of the definition, I just wanna emphasize that the important things about this is that it is really driven by community priorities and community voice to, uh, to help define where that expertise is needed. Um, and it also involves a lot of collaboration which means that for this particular project, we had quite a lot of different entities involved. So um, just to give you a brief background on how all this came together, um, the American Geophysical Union, which is a professional organization for earth and space scientists, they have a program called Thriving Earth Exchange, which supports community science um, by helping find those resources and connect that expertise with communities to help solve problems. Um, a lot of those are related to climate, climate change. So you will have often um, a town, say, in the middle of Missouri that is experiencing repeated flooding issues, and they are looking for ways to help um, solve that. So through Thriving Earth Exchange, they will help connect with scientists from all over, doesn't have to be local, um, to help collect data, define questions, analyze that data and um, make some progress on whatever that specific issue is. So early last year, the University Alliance, which is based out of UW-Madison, worked with Thriving Earth Exchange to have a Wisconsin specific cohort um, from Thriving Earth Exchange. So if you go to their website and you look at their list of projects, there are several cities in Wisconsin that have various projects happening. One of them, of course, is Sun Prairie, um, but University Alliance is how I got connected with all of this. So we have Thriving Earth Exchange, which helps coordinate community science projects. We have University Alliance that helps connect communities with the resources available at UW. We have 1000 Friends, which of course works statewide with communities. Um, the city of Sun Prairie had a very specific project having to do with No Mo May that they wanted to boost efforts for public engagement and sustainability. And then of course we have all this expertise available right here at the UW-Madison and all this came together for this project. So we have these different roles um, and before I hand it off to the speaker, I just speakers, I wanna explain what these different roles are. So the community leaders are really based in the, in the place of the, you know, the problem or issue that's being addressed. Um, today we have Sandy Zhang and Cindy Bertley from the city of Sun Prairie. 
Um, another key person who is no longer with the city but was pretty involved way up until the end of April was Scott Semrock, who was the sustainability coordinator there. Um, we also have our community scientists from University of Wisconsin Graton Lab. Um, we have Dr. Hannah Gaines Day with us today. We also, from that lab, worked with Dr. Genevieve Pugasek, who um, has since left her postdoctoral position with another another position with the Xerxes Society, but she was really pretty integral in this as well. And then the Community Science Fellow, that's what I did. Um, I don't do science at all, but I helped manage the project and keep things on a timeline and make the connections to get all this to happen. So I'm gonna introduce our speakers and then hand it off. Uh, we're gonna hear first from Sun Prairie staff. Sandy is the Strategic Planning and Engagement Manager for the City of Sun Prairie, overseeing the departmental operations of the Administrator's Office to advance the city's efforts in equity and sustainability. She works across departments to support the city's strategic planning, employee engagement, and organizational development initiatives. Cindy is the Parks and Forestry Division Manager at the City of Sun Prairie, where she oversees the management and operations of over 40 city parks and over 10,000 public trees in the city of Sun Prairie. Um, the next thing we'll hear is from Dr. Hannah Gaines Day, who is a research scientist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Department of Entomology. Her research interests broadly relate to the impact of local and landscape scale resources on wild and managed pollinators and agroecosystems. Since 2006, she has conducted research in a diversity of Wisconsin agricultural systems, including potato, cranberry, apple, small scale mixed vegetable and commercial beekeeping. She also helped develop the community science program WeBe, the Wisconsin Wild Bee app, which uses an app based platform to collect data on pollinator activity across the state. And you're gonna hear a lot about that from her in a bit. Um, so I believe it is Sandy's turn to speak. And Sandy, you can just let me know when you're ready for me to advance the slides. Thanks, Susan. Yes, go ahead. All right, so um, I wanted to kick off to just kind of give some context about Sun Prairie if you aren't familiar. Um, so Sun Prairie is the second largest um, community in Dane County, um, located just northeast of Madison, um, and we're sitting at about 37,000 residents. Um, and so uh, sustainability has been something that we've really been um, working toward advancing in the last, I um, wanna say five years or so. Um, in 2019, our council completed a strategic plan. Um, and from that strategic plan, sustainability was um, identified as a priority area for the council and community. Um, and since the creation of that strategic plan, um, we've created a, a task force which disbanded in 2020, um, but that led to the um, creation of a permanent sustainability committee, which is still in existence today, um, along with the hiring of our first sustainability coordinator, who, as Susan mentioned, um, was Scott Semrock. And, uh, and so right in front of you here, um, you have the, the work of our task force. Um, so the task force defined sustainability for Sun Prairie, identified um, several priority areas and goals, um, and the task force actually had 115 recommendations for the city to complete in the next um, one to seven years. Um, so it's it's a very aggressive uh, plan, and it's it's a, it's a, it's a something you can find on our city website. Um, but it goes to show that um, there is community support for advancing sustainability in our community. Um, you can move to the next slide, Susan. And so this is how we've really approached our sustainability efforts. Um, we've started with our circle of control. So really looking at our municipal operations, um, buildings, fleet, uh, updating our purchasing policy. Um, right now where um, we've been working on a green infrastructure update to our, our municipal code um, and our planning department is working through um, a zoning code rewrite. And so these are all things that we can control at our, at our level. Um, we also understand the importance of both the circles of influence and awareness. And so um, this is where Nomo May comes in. We were really interested in um, now engaging our residents and community um, and identifying ways to um, not only increase that engagement, but also find ways to connect with them in ways where they as an individual can support our community in advancing sustainability. Next slide. And this is where No Mo May comes in. Um, and so No Mo May is, encourages um, 
our residents to limit their lawn mowing practices during the month of May um, for several reasons, as you can see on the screen here. Um, Sun Prairie uh, ran a pilot program for No Mow May in 2022, um, and we continue the program this year. And so uh, No Mow May was pioneered by Appleton um, here in the States, and several communities have continued to adapt um, No Mow May. Um, including um, several in the state, such as Milwaukee, Madison, Stevens Point, Fitchburg, Wausau, um, and many more. Um, and so the objective is, as you see on the screen, to create habitat and resources for our early season pollinators. Um, this is especially critical in um, urban communities um, where we know that flower resources can be limited. Um, we also recognize that um, there have been um, studies to, to uh, show benefits um, in the community, such as increasing bee abundance and diversity. Um, and we recognize that with no mow may um, or, a var or a variance of it, um, that can reduce the mowing frequency, which in turn saves water, reduces cost, emissions, and noise from the use of gas-powered lawn equipment. Next slide. Um, so, you can see here, I've touched on this a little bit, um, and last year we had a total of 342 registrations. Um, and a lot of the feedback that we got from our participants last year was um, participants wanted to do more. Um, so um, whether that was reducing, um, you know, in addition to reducing or not mowing their lawn during the month of May. Um, and so we, um, looked into the Thriving Earth Exchange program with University Alliance, and um, we were able to find um, both find this program, which has allowed us to um, engage our communities in a way that we would not have been able to do otherwise. Um, so we conducted two training sessions with our community on using the Weeby app, and um, we also had um, areas in our community where folks could use to um, participate in um, in the Weeby app community science portion. Um, so we are a member of the Mayor's Monarch Pledge. Um, and um, in addition to um, participating in No Mow May, this, in, this commitment um, supports our efforts um, as a signatory um, for, for Mayor's Monarch Pledge. Um, you can see here, we, um, this picture is actually taken by, our, uh, by Cindy, um, and so I mentioned earlier that uh, part residents could participate in various ways. Um, so in, in addition to um, mowing their lawn, not mowing their lawn at all during the month of May, some could choose to mow less frequently or um, when they, you know, were ready to do it. Um, and so um, that was a, a picture that she took of someone's lawn um, as a participant of um, some mow May. Next slide. Um, for, so for this year's efforts, um, we are still working on our 2023 impact report, um, but we had a total of 174 total registrants this year, including one commercial property, um, two school district properties, and 171 residential properties, um, including one rental property. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the city itself did participate as well. And so you can see here on the screen, we have um, several parks that, several city properties that are parks managed. Um, and um, we have some pictures on the right hand side there. So you can kind of see um, what some of those spaces were. Um, the school district had two middle schools participate. Um, and so they also had um, teachers who, um, use the Weeby app with their students. Um, so the school district was able to get approval um, to have students uh, get access to that so that they could um, participate in the community science portion as well. Um, we also had two areas in our, uh, within our parks um, that participated in the community science portion. Um, so we, we recognize that there may be folks who um, don't live in a home and might not have access to a lawn, um, but may still want to participate in the community science portion. So we identified two areas in our community where our uh, park staff mowed a portion of the, the, uh, the green space um, and allowed the other side to grow. And um, that was an opportunity for um, residents to participate um, who wouldn't have been able to otherwise. 
Um, and again, as I mentioned, um, we completed a 2022 impact report um, based on last year's efforts. Um, and a 2023 impact report is in the works for um, this year as well. Um, and I'm really excited to incorporate um, the WEBE data um, that was collected by our community scientists as a part of that report. That's my portion. I'll turn it over to you, Hannah. Yes. And Thanks. I think Hannah's going to be sharing her slides instead of me because she knows exactly which ones. Um, so Susan, I need to let her share her screen. <laughs> okay, you should be able to now. Great. See, where's our slideshow? Okay, can everyone see my screen now? Great. Okay, so um, I'm going to take a little bit of a step back and talk about um, pollinators and sort of why we even care about pollinators and providing resources for them in the first place. So um, first of all, why are pollinators important? 85% um, of all flowering plants depend on pollinators for seed production and fruit production. So in order for reproduction, they need, they need pollinators to come visit the flowers. This includes about 35% of all crop plants, so, or another way of looking at that, is, this is one in every three bites you eat is dependent on pollinators. Um, a grocery store out east did a, a it showed a, a display a few years ago what their produce section would look like without pollinators, just to show the impact on our everyday diet um, if we lost bees. So what does it what does it mean they're dependent on pollinators and what happens if if a plant that requires pollination didn't get pollinated? This this photo shows you um, sort of a range of of possibilities. Um, for the most dependent crops, for example, apple, if they don't have pollination, they don't produce any fruit. In this picture, you can see strawberries, watermelon, and cucumber, and they received insufficient pollination and produce funny shaped or small fruits, which aren't really um, economically viable for the growers. I like to use the watermelon as an example. So for to produce an economically viable watermelon that looks like a nice solid big watermelon, the plant requires 2,000 grains of pollen to be moved from the male flowers to the female flowers. So just to give you a um, sort of a magnitude of, of how much work the pollinators are doing for different crops. Um, so which insects are pollinators? This is a nice illustration from the Nature Conservancy that shows you a little bit of the diversity of pollinators. Um, you can see we have butterflies, moths, bees, beetles, wasps. There are lots of different insects that pollinate plants, just meaning that they'll pick up pollen and move it between flowers. But bees are really the most important pollinators. And there's a number of reasons why bees are the most important pollinators. Um, the first is that they're really just built to carry pollen. So if you look at this illustration, um, you see you can see some of the bees have pollen really packed on their legs and packed on their body. Um, the bees, like in the upper left, you see the sweat bee helictus. Um, they have on their, their back legs, they have a, a thing called scopa. It's sort of like a comb. And when they land on the flower, the, the pollen just sticks to them. We have two groups of corbiculate bees, that's um, the honeybees and the bumblebees. And if you look at their back leg, the, very, the bee in the very middle of this picture, um, you see it's sort of a flattened, they've got a flattened leg and that's called a corbicula or the pollen basket. And they, they take the pollen and build it into bundles and carry it in, in nice packed balls on the back, back legs. So that's the first reason that bees are the most important is that they're really built to pick up pollen. Um, a second reason they're the most important pollinators is because the young um, depend on pollen to develop. So the, the job of an adult female bee is to collect pollen and provision her nest with, with pollen. So that's, that's really important. And then the third reason that bees are the most important pollinators is because they have a behavior called floral constancy, which means on any individual um, foraging trip, they're visiting the same type of flowers. So they might go out and visit apple, 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 or they might go on another foraging trip and visit dandelion, dandelion, dandelion. Um, that's important from the plant perspective because they'll be delivering the correct type of pollen that the plant needs to reproduce. 
So when many people think about bees, they, they um, have an image of honeybees in their mind. So honeybees are extremely important for agricultural production, for pollination of agricultural crops. This slide shows you a, a photo of an almond orchard in California. Um, and for these types of crop productions, they just bring in truckloads of honeybees and put them in the orchard when it's blooming. Um, honeybees are great crop pollinators because they're generalist pollinators. They visit lots of different types of plants. Um, you can, they live in a social colony. You can have up to 60,000 individual bees um, in one hive and they're, you can pick them up and move them. So this is showing you a commercial bee yard. These hives are on pallets that they can easily use like a forklift and pick up four hives at a time, stack them all on their truck and drive them to the crop field where they're needed. So they're very convenient for crop pollination. But honeybees are not native to North America. So honeybees were brought to uh, North America in the 1600s with the settlers um, from Europe, originally for wax production for making candles. And this, this slide just shows you the progression of um, when bees made it all the way across the, this country. Um, but in Wisconsin, we have over 400 species of native wild pollinators. In, um, in the whole world, there's about 20,000 species. We have 400 of those species in Wisconsin, Wisconsin. In this slide, you can see there's a pretty big diversity of different types of pollinators. We've got big, big, big bumblebees, little tiny sweat bees, um, and everything in between. Um, we have um, some social native bees. So the bumblebees are our one group of social bees. That means that they have a queen with workers in the, a colony. Um, but most bees are solitary bees. So about 90% of all bees are solitary. This shows you some little green sweat bees. And that means that there's no queen, there's no workers. All of the females are reproductive. They have their own nest um, where they, they, provision, they lay eggs and provision their eggs with, with um, food. So native bees are particularly important for pollinating native plants. This photo shows you a picture of a bumblebee visiting a cranberry flower. Um, and the reason for this is that they evolved together. So native bees and native plants evolved together. So they have, um, they, they, they work well together. So what are some other benefits of the wild, of wild bees? Um, one behavior that wild bees have, in particular bumblebees, is they're able to buzz pollinate. So some flowers, the pollen is sort of hidden inside the flower. And you can see in this video, the bumblebee is able to buzz the flower and the pollen is coming out. Um, honeybees can't do this. Um, and, and so you may have heard in some countries in greenhouses, they'll use tuning forks. That's the same, the same um, note that bees buzz at to release pollen, for example, in tomato plants. Um, wild bees often are better pollinators because they deposit more pollen on a single visit than honeybees will deposit. Um, what that means is you have fewer visits to fully pollinate a plant. Um, we also have seen in our research that there's a benefit of having a diverse wild bee community. So um, relying on a single pollinator species like honeybees is dangerous because if that bee disappears, then you lose all of your pollination services. If you have a diverse pollinator community, then hopefully, even if some species are declining, others are, are increasing or maintaining, and you, you maintain um, a certain level of pollination service required for, for uh, pollination of plants. Um, having a diverse community also gives you um, complementary pollination services. So this is a really nice figure showing um, on the bottom axis is time of day, and on the um, left axis is the flowering height. So different bees have different behaviors. And you can see here that, um, for example, honeybees are active in the middle of the day and they tend to visit uh, flowers that are up high. Solitary bees are active for a shorter period, but in the middle of the day and bumblebees have a longer longer um, foraging time in the day and also will forage up high. Here we also have hoverflies, which are active earlier in the day and they visit flowers at all different heights. Um, you may also have heard about or seen headlines of this about the insect apocalypse and how insects are dying all over the world. And, and what does this mean for humans? What are we gonna do about this? And this is true for, um, for pollinators as well. So, so pollinators in general are in decline as well. Um, and the different factors that are affecting pollinators include um, changes in land cover. So urbanization or um, 
crop changes in crop production, so more monoculture fields where there's fewer resources through time, uh, disease um, pathogens spread from managed to wild bees, habitat degradation where you lose resources that the bees need, um, climate change, so you have sometimes you'll have a mismatch in, in bee phenology and floral phenology, so when the bees emerge um, in the spring, the flowers they need are not there anymore, um, and then um, exposure to chemical pesticides. So what can we do to help the pollinators? Um, bees really need three things to survive. One is protection from pesticides. Um, and then the other two are sort of combined. They need, they need habitat that provide food resources, so flowers, and they need um, re uh, resources for nesting. Um, and all of the things you can do for wild bees will also help honeybees because honeybees also need flowers. Um, so what does this look like on like a, a individual homeowner's um, scale? So one, you can reduce or eliminate pesticides around your yard and garden. Um, you can buy plants from nurseries that don't treat with pesticides. Um, you can ask at nurseries where you get them, what the treatment has been before you get the plants. Um, this, will re this will reduce exposure to the bees to pesticides. And then you can create habitat. So um, if there's only one thing that you remember from today's talk, um, I want you to remember that the most important thing that any single person can do for bees is provide flowers. So, so the more flowers, uh, diversity, color, shape, bloom, uh, bloom periods from early spring through fall, the more flowers you can provide during that growing season, um, the more bees that you're helping. And this is, so, so we know from research that you can do these things in urban areas, even though there's a lot of built up, um, built up areas, you can provide resources for bees in these habitats. And even um, in, in France, they did a study and found that the bees in the urban landscapes were actually healthier than bees in agricultural landscapes, mostly because um, they had reduced exposure to agricultural chemicals. So um, I'm gonna transition a little bit here to talk about this app we ha have called Weebee. Um, and sort of talk about why we developed it and, and what it's for and how you can use it yourself. Um, so what is Weebee? Weebee is a community science smartphone app designed to survey bees visiting blooming plants. So it's a very simple, it's sort of a, um, it's a modified timer. So it's sort of a fancy timer on your smartphone where you can stop at a flower for five minutes and record the bees that are visiting. Um, each survey is five minutes, and what we're tracking here is the number of visits to flowers. So we're not counting bees, we're counting visits to flowers because that's what translates to pollination services. Um, collecting this data will help us understand better sort of how bee activity varies across the state. When you do these surveys, it um, drops a, a pin on your exact location, and we can use that to understand how the landscape around your observation point is impacting pollinators in, in your area and across the state where all of these surveys are taken. So um, this app is available for Apple or Android devices. You can download it on the App Store or get it on Google Play. This slide just shows you um, a picture of what it looks like when you actually have the app on your phone. Um, so going back to um, why we developed this app and community science, so community science allows you to collect a vast amount of data um, because you sort of crowdsource the data collection. And there are a few um, community science projects in and around Madison and the state that you may have heard about. Bumblebee Brigade is one that tracks bumblebees. They use photo, um, photo surveys of bumblebees and then experts will identify them so we can map out where different species of bumblebees live in the state. The tick app maps where people are encountering ticks. Um, Aubon Christmas bird count, that's sort of a long running uh, community science project where they, they look at uh, birds, uh, sort of a snapshot of the birds at Christmas time. Um, there's a crane count run through the um, Crane Foundation and then the Urban Canid Project out of UW-Madison, which is looking at foxes and coyotes in the urban environment. So these are all sort of um, different community science projects that if you're interested, you can check them out and, and participate as well. So why did we develop Weeby? So um, the Graton Lab is 
our sort of our general focus is looking at the landscape ecology of beneficial insects in agricultural landscapes. So we work with a lot of different farmer groups. And um, one group we work with is apple growers. And uh, apple, you may be familiar with, with apple bloom is a very short bloom period in the spring. It lasts from about one to two weeks. And we would go out there and do observations on um, bees visiting the flowers and the growers would say, oh, this is awesome. Do, you, do we have enough wild bees to pollinate our apple or do we need to bring honeybees? And in order to answer that question, we need a lot more data than just our research team can collect on our own. And so we developed this app to, to put the data collection in the hands of the growers to help them understand if they have enough wild bees in their um, orchards or on their farms to provide full pollination for their crops. Um, and so we know from previous studies that bee communities vary at a local scale. Um, this is both in agricultural landscapes and also in suburban and urban landscapes. And this is mainly a factor of, of the floral resources. So what's, a, what's available in the immediate, immediate surrounding area. Um, this is also true in um, the a bees also vary in a, a landscape scale. So sort of what's immediately available is important, but also what's around further around you is important as well. This is because um, bees are central place foragers. They have a, a nest where they, they forage from and come back to that same nest every time. And the distance they can forage is proportional to the size of the bee. So honeybees are fairly large compared to other bees. They can, they can forage um, up to a few miles. Bumblebees can forage up to a few miles, but some of those smaller sweat bees only can forage up to a, a hundred meters or, or so. And so um, you can see this in these slides that the surrounding landscape could be is vastly different depending if you're in a rural or um, urban landscape. And so um, because of this, there some areas have lots of bees and some do not. And so um, what we wanted to do was crowdsource a collection of data on, on bees across the state get more eyes on the ground to understand how these local and landscape level resources impact pollinators in agricultural landscapes, but also in urban areas where, where we might have more people doing observations. So here on the left, we have a cranberry, um, and on the right, we've got some agricultural areas with, with prairie plantings and vegetable crops. Um, all of the data collected in Weeby is available for people to look at on our data dashboard. Um, this is just a quick summary of uh, the 2022 field season. And you can see we had over 800 users and over 5,000 surveys done um, with almost 300,000 insect observations, which is just incredible. And so much more data than we ever could collect with just our research team alone. Um, and so uh, we, we um, teamed up with Sun Prairie because this seemed like a perfect opportunity to use this tool that we had already developed to collect more data about um, pollinators in Sun Prairie to help them understand the impact of Noma May in their local community. So we're still um, pulling that data together and we'll hopefully have some, some nice figures soon to add to the report that Sandy mentioned. Um, but for now, if, if you're interested in Use, or in trying out Weeby, you can visit our website, um, pollinators.wisc.edu backslash or slash Weeby um, and learn more about the app itself. So I'm going to talk you through a little bit about um, the process and how to, how to use Weeby. So the first thing you need to do is download the app. Um, the next step is learning to identify the six groups of pollinators that we have in our app. So the, the groups that we have um, are bumblebee, honeybee, large dark bee, small dark bee, small green bee, and then non bees. And so um, bumblebees, you're probably familiar with, they're our nice big fuzzy, uh, biggest um, native bees around here. Honeybees are uh, managed bees that you see commonly around um, the landscape. They're often honey colored, a little bit smaller than bumblebees with a nice heart shaped face. Um, large dark bees, often our early spring bees are included in this large dark bees. These are mainly mining bees, ground nesting mining bees. Um, they're the main apple pollinators in Wisconsin. We've got small dark bees, which are the sweat bees, which you might see if you're outside and it's hot and you're sweaty and they'll, they'll land on your arm and lick you or sometimes bite you. Um, green bees are another type of sweat bee that are look like sort of flying Christmas ornaments. Um, and then non-bees includes flies, wasps, butterflies, any other insect that might visit the flowers. And so we have this 
sort of um, quick guide to these groups. You can find this on our website as well that talks you through how to identify these different um, these different groups. Um, so I have a, a couple of slides here to tell you um, sort of more um, detailed descriptions of how to tell these different groups apart. So bees have four wings. They have fuzzy bodies and legs because they're built to collect pollen. Um, they have long antennae. You can see coming right out of the face, their face there. Relatively small eyes, and they're actively collecting pollen. So behavior is a very key um, characteristic to, to differentiate between bees and other insects. Bees will actively be collecting pollen. They don't often just land on a leaf or a flower. Um, there's a reason that we have the term busy, busy as a bee. Um, honeybees, I've mentioned a few times, they're honey colored, heart shaped faces. They collect the pollen on those back legs in the, in the pollen baskets in balls. They're also very busy and often less skittish than the, the native bees. Native bees can be uh, more skittish. So when you walk up to a flower patch, they might fly away, whereas a honeybee kind of ignores you. Um, wasps also have four wings, but they're generally not fuzzy. They're more shiny, brightly colored. They, uh, many of them have that skinny waist. Um, they don't actively collect pollen. They're usually on flowers to collect and to just drink nectar. Uh, some examples here are yellow jackets, hornets, and paper wasps. Flies are another group that we often see visiting, visiting um, flowers. They only have two wings. You can see this, the upper picture here, you can see a nice uh, top view down of the, the two wings for a fly. They have huge eyes. The eyes take up like the whole front of their face and they've got short stubby antenna. So you can see compared to the bees, they have much, much shorter antennae. Um, poll, um, flies generally don't collect pollen. They often will land on a, a leaf or a flower and just sit there for a little bit. And some examples, um, they, that we, we see are hoverflies, houseflies. Um, the top picture here is a, a hoverfly and the, the bottom is a housefly. And then I've got, um, I think we have a few minutes here. So I'm gonna go through these bee or not a bee quiz just, just for fun. Um, so I'm gonna leave it on these slides for a few seconds. Um, I want you to tell yourself, you know, guess for yourself it's a bee or not a bee. And um, then I'll, I'll click to the next slide and you can see if you got it right. Okay, moving to the next slide. This is not a bee, this is a wasp. You can tell because it has that skinny waist. It is not fuzzy and it's got the coloration on its body. Okay, I'll leave it here for a few seconds. Is this a bee or not a bee? This is a honeybee. You can see it's uh, a bit fuzzy. It's got four wings and it's got those long antennae. Next one, B or not a B, I'll leave it here for a few seconds. This is one of our green bees. You can see it's got those nice long antennae. It's got four wings. It's a little harder to see the wings here because they're folded up. Um, but you also see it's got fuzzy legs. You can see those sort of whitish colored hairs on its back leg. Next one, I'll leave it here for a few seconds. This is not a bee, this is a fly. You can see it's got only two wings. It has huge eyes and it's got those short stubby antennae. Next picture, we'll leave this here for a few seconds. This one is a little bit tricky, but this is one of our small dark bees. You can see it's got the long antennae. If you were seeing it in person, you'd see that it has fuzzy legs and the four wings again. Next picture, we'll leave it here for a few seconds. This is not a bee, this is a wasp. You can see it's skinny waist and then it's got the very um, stark coloration on its body. Next one, we'll leave this oak here for a few seconds. This is not a bee, this is a fly. It's got those two wings, short stubby antennae, and again, the huge eyeballs. Got another one here, leave it for a few seconds.
This one is a bee. This would fall into our large dart category. You can see the nice pollen on its back legs. It's got long antennae and it's quite fuzzy. So um, we've got more material like that in our, our Weeby app. We've got a quiz that you take before you can take any surveys. We have you take a quiz to identify um, the six groups of pollinators. Um, and then we also have this one-page guide to collecting data and how to complete your surveys. So these are also available on our website. Um, I'll just walk you through real, real briefly. Um, we modified this um, the, date, the direction sheet here for Nomo May, but there's a general one on our website as well. Um, for Nomo May, we had directions on how they should mow their lawn or not mow their lawn um, because we wanted to compare bee visits in mowed and unmowed areas. Um, but so the first step would be to prepare to survey, select your observation area. We ask people to do observations in about a three foot by three foot area in front of them. Um, when you click start survey, we have this um, sort of metadata we collect on um, what type of habitat you're in, what type of flower you're looking at, what's the weather like. Um, and then when you start your survey, we have you collect the number of insects visiting flowers rather than the, we're not counting the number of insects, we're counting the number of visits to flowers. So this shows you an example. This would be three visits if that bee visits each of those three flowers. Um, all of this is recorded on this fancy timer with the six different bee groups. And once you've collected your data, you can uh, go look at your My Data screen and compare you know, how, what proportion of the bees, you, of the insects you saw were wild bees, honeybees, non-bees. Um, once you've done a number of surveys, you can compare how your visits um, vary through time or between different plants. Um, if, you know, if you survey in the early morning or the late afternoon, or if you survey, you know, tomatoes in June, and then you still have tomatoes blooming in July, you could survey again and see how that's, that varies. Um, so as I mentioned, this data is all available on our data dashboard. The, the specific location is sort of blurred so that um, for privacy reasons, each of these squares is about, I think, a one mile by one mile square. So your data would be within that one mile square. So no one would tell exactly where you were collecting data. Um, so to learn more about Weeby, please visit our website. And I think um, we've got plenty of time for questions if people have questions. Yes, thank you so much. I'm going to enable the chat so that anybody with questions can put those in the chat. Um, so while you're thinking of those and typing those out, I just wanna say again, thank you to our speakers. Um, I know that this is a busy time of year for city staff, but it's a really busy time of year for anybody who works with pollinator, <laughs> with pollinators. So I appreciate so much the time you've taken. Um, I also just think this was a really fun topic to have during pollinator week, and especially um, given our history with 1000 friends in land use and you know, looking at, at smart ways to grow urban areas and, and good design and environmental preservation. This is just a really good way to bring those things together. Um, so I don't see questions in the chat. Oh yeah, hold on. Okay, Mark says, are all flowering plants created equally for bees or in Wisconsin, are there particular ones that are better? Hannah, I assume this is a question for you. Sure. Um, great question. The answer, the sort of short answer to your question is no, all flowering plants are not created equal for bees. Um, different plants have different um, sort of uh, nutritional content in their pollen and nectar. Um, and so bees need to visit a variety of flowers to get their full nutrition. Um, if you are interested in providing um, excellent plants for wild bees in Wisconsin, you can visit the Xerces website. I can post that in the, in the chat in a minute, but the Xerces Society is a conservation organization in, Wisconsin, in, the, in the US and it's the, really the biggest native bee conservation organization. And they have a pollinator resource center that um, gives you lots of information with like region specific flowering plants that are good for bees in your area. Um, so I can I can post that in the chat in just a minute, but that would be a great place to go look for more information on which bees to plant um, for bees. Thank you. 
There is a question from Grace. Thank you for the great webinar. I have two questions. One, how can other initiatives such as bee or insect houses or watering stations or feeders influence bee abundance in urban areas? And second, does the health and abundance of urban bees influence bees beneficial for crop pollination? Hannah, I assume that's also for you. Um, sure. Um, I just posted the Xerces link for anyone who's interested in, in learning more about that. Um, so uh, with bee insect houses, I assume you're talking about like those um, bee hotels. Um, those I think are good learning uh, resources. They attract bees and wasps and solitary bees and wasps to nest in them. Um, but they can harbor disease. So it's important to get rid of those, you know, to switch them out year once the bees emerge you can put the um if you overwinter them like in the garage or in a, a bucket or something make sure there's a hole so the bees can get out but that new bees can't get in um, and put new houses up you know every year every couple of years so that disease is not um, being harbored in them and then burning the old ones just in case there is disease um water water is an important um factor for 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 bees, um, so I think providing water is is great. Um, I don't know that hummingbird feeders would, uh, you know, if hummingbirds are um, they they generally visit red flowers um, or sort of flowers in that in that area in that color range that are deeper plants. So if you have flowers like that in your yard, then hummingbird feeder would attract them to your yard. Uh, in general, they're not. Um, you know, huge, they're not hugely important pollinators, I don't think. Um, let's see. Um, does the health and abundance of urban bees influence? Um, I guess the short answer is yes, the health and abundance of urban bees um, does influence bees that are beneficial for crop pollination. Um, as far as whether the bees would, would, you know, if you have an urban garden, then sure you have you can um, get good pollination if you provide resources for the bees around your urban garden. The bees that you have in an urban area wouldn't get out for to example for a to a farm field. Um, I'm not sure if maybe you're also talking about honeybees, um, and in this case, um, oftentimes hobby beekeepers are hesitant to put chemicals in their hives, and um, Treating mites in honeybees is really the most important thing you can do if you're keeping honeybees, because uh, if you don't, then they turn into sort of mite bombs, and then those can, can negatively affect um, honeybees that are out in in rural areas as well. Does that, I don't know if that answers answers the question totally. Thank you. I think, uh, so by the way, before I get to the next question, I just want to say that all the links and things that were shared, I will send out after the webinar to everybody who registered. So don't worry about saving those anywhere. Those will go out, including to the Xerxes Society too. Um, so this is a question, I think I'm going to, to lob this one over to the Sun Prairie folks. How do we crack the nut to encourage people to stop using broadleaf herbicide on their lawn? I see folks doing no mow may and all they have is grass. And so um, I'm wondering if you can speak to that and also kind of what you're hoping this project will do to impact broader sustainability efforts in your city. So either one of you, Sandy or Cindy. Yeah, I can kick us off and Cindy, please chime in. Um, it is tough. Um, I know that is something that when we um, send out communications to all of our participants that um, we kind of shared, you know, outside of No Mome, right, which is a moment in time. Um, here are additional ways that you can support pollinators. Um, Cause I think that, um, you know, in addition to, you know, not having to mow your lawn, right? That's a nice benefit there too. Um, I think a lot of folks are really interested and invested in doing more and feeling like they have their own agency um, to support pollinators. And so um, for us, I think it's, uh, it's a lot of communication and ongoing communication to uh, an engagement to um, help with that understanding. Um, and we definitely did tell folks that, hey, if all you have is grass, um, you know, there there really isn't a benefit. Um, and so we really um, emphasize the importance of having, you know, that creeping Charlie, the dandelions to to be those resources for pollinators. Um, 
Cindy, if you want to chime in. Yeah, I think that's great, Sandy. I um, like we said in the in the webinar here last year was the first year that the city of Sun Prairie did this, and I received a lot of phone calls um, from residents that had comments or questions about No Mow May, and to kind of piggyback on this, I, I think education is a big part of it because those these are the exact conversations I would have is. They want to do something for the pollinators, but they're not sure what it is, and they're not sure if they want to stop mowing their grass. Or some people did stop mowing their grass, but they were still spraying their dandelions with weed killer. And so a lot of the conversations I had was just kind of the general education to kind of reiterate what Hannah and Sandy were saying was about it is about the flowers and handing on to the flowers. And so trying to figure out the flexibility of what people can do in their own spaces and the, the type of space they have. Um, trying to adapt it to give them the best tools on on what they can do if they weren't willing to do um, or if they couldn't do some of the other practices. So yeah, I, to go along with that, I think education is the biggest thing. Thank you. And I, I saw that Hannah shared a link to um, some resource from UW Extension, which is underutilized, I think. I think UW Extension is great. Okay, question from Steve. I'm a Fitchburg participant. Is there any data collection or feedback um, going on in Fitchburg to assess impact on weed eater participation? I don't know if we have an answer to that. Is anybody yeah. else in Fitchburg here? <laughs> I haven't heard anything come from Fitchburg. Um, that's not to say that people in Fitchburg maybe did weeby surveys and selected no mow may, um, but there's no sort of official uh, tallying that I know of. Um, and Hannah, I'm just going to toot your horn just to say that I've seen her present the, you know, some version of the presentation she did here, you know, as training for Sun Prairie at the library and also for their sustainability uh, committee, I guess. And it's, it's really great and people are really engaged and um, the quiz is really fun. I always aim to get 100%. <laughs> but I think that um, folks from the Graton Lab are available to help with these trainings if you ask really nicely. <laughs> um, okay, great question from Abby. Are there recommended alternatives to planting grass in a yard? I'm gonna put another resource in the chat here. Uh, University of Minnesota has a whole page on bee lawns, um, and this is sort of, uh, you can often find, I think, um, seed mixes for bee lawns that are uh, non-grass, but um, low-maintenance plants that provide resources for bees. Great. I, too, would love a bee lawn. Um, I have a question for the city of Sun Prairie folks, just because this is this came up a lot as we were meeting over the last year to figure out this project. And that is um, this year and last year, were there comments or pushback from residents who were not happy about all the tall grass? I feel like this is a conversation city staff have a lot. Um, neighbor complaints, basically. Yes, um, so we definitely um, did have complaints. Um, I, you know, I haven't checked in with our building inspection team yet, but um, I, based on this year's data, I have not personally received any um, calls or complaints about No Mome. I believe last year we had nine complaints, nine or 11 to our building inspection division. And I know Cindy took some calls as well. Um, and, um, you know, I, th I think after having conversation and providing some education as to why, you know, there, why the city was participating in it, I think folks were understanding. Um, and so I think that really helped this year's efforts, um, for me at least, to, to not receive any of those complaints. Um, you know, does that mean everyone's on board? Probably not. Um, what we did do was we did, um, we did suspend our ordinance. And so um, typically our ordinance requires grass to be below um, eight inches. And so, um, you know, by suspending that ordinance, um, our building inspection was not actively, um, you know, inspecting properties that, um, you know, where their lawn may have surpassed that that eight inches. Um, but I think I've, you know, anecdotally, I've, I've heard really good feedback. Um, I had participants reach out to me via email to share pictures of their lawns um, and, and stories 
Um, and I uh, got some really nice notes from um, the school district as well. And so, um, you know, I think it's something that we are normalizing in our community around May. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think it is just one of the many ways that residents can um, support our pollinators, right? And so I think that's been something that I've been really um, pushing on is, you know, Nomo May is just one piece. And um, it's it's different, right, to see the the tall grass and, and the, the dandelions. Um, but um, there there is a benefit to that. And um, I think it's just a nice talking point to have that conversation with a community member. Another question, I think this one's going to be for Hannah. Will we be data help track impact and benefits to pollinators that are related to drought? Um, that's a great question. So um, we, the data that we bring in, we will be able to analyze that differently. So pulling out um, land cover data, climate data. Um, so so that is one question we could look at. We, we received a grant this winter um, and we'll be bringing in a grad student this fall to start working with WB data. And so um, I think that's one thing that she'll be looking at is how does the WB, um, does the visit rate in different parts of the state vary with land cover as well as climate, you know, temperature and precipitation data. Um, so that's definitely an area that we will be able to look at. Thank you. All right, it's 1257, so we technically have three minutes to one o'clock. So if anybody's got any burning questions, now is the time. But we may have covered everything that everybody wanted to know about. So not seeing anything else in the chat, I think I'll just, we'll just end it here. I wanna thank everybody again for coming. Thank you again to our speakers. And once again, I will send out all the information with links um, to everyone who registered for the webinar. So you can find, you can dig in a little deeper and, and find out more about this on your own. So um, yes, we'll post this to YouTube. The question, will this recording be sent out? We post the, these to YouTube and I will, that link will go out with everything else. So it may take until later today or later this week, but. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks. Thank you.